The scripture for today's sermon comes from Psalm 69, 1 through 13. The word of God speaks to us like this. Save me, God, for the water has risen to my neck. I have sunk in deep mud and there is no footing. I have come into deep water and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary from my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Those who hate me without cause are more numerous than the hairs of my head. My deceitful enemies who would destroy me are powerful. Though I did not steal, I must repay. God, you know my foolishness and my guilty acts are not hidden from you. Do not let those who put their, ho who put their hope in you be disgraced because of me. Lord God of armies, do not let those who seek you be humiliated because of me, God of Israel. For I have endured insults because of you, and shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and a foreigner to my mother's sons. Because zeal for your house has consumed me, and the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. I mourned and fasted, but it brought me insults. I wore sackcloth as my clothing, and I was a joke to them. Those who sit at the city gate talk about me, and drunkards make up songs about me. But as for me, Lord, my prayer to you is for a time of favor. In your abundant, faithful love, God, answer me with your sure salvation. This is the very word of God to us. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. Thanks, Marissa. You guys can have a seat. Um, God, we pray that by your spirit, you would do what you're eager to do, and that's to meet with us through your word. Um, God, for some of us, a passage like this feels very familiar. And for some of us, the language in this passage feels foreign and uncomfortable and um, maybe like it lacks faith or hope. So God, would you teach us through your word? You say that all scripture is profitable for us. Um, so show us that today, God. And ultimately, what we want is to be satisfied with the good news of Jesus in our place. Um, that you invite us to yourself, broken as we are, doubting as we are, hurting as we are. You invite us to yourself, and you say that you're a good father. So would you show us, God, through your word, unite us, that we might fear your name, that we might love you. It's in your name, Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I need, I, need to, uh, I need to start by saying, I say this sometimes, anytime I mention a song or a movie or anything like that, that's not my blessing to go watch it or listen to it. It's just something as I was studying the passage I thought of, okay? So in uh, 1998, the great theologian Jay-Z uh, came, <laughs> came out with a song called The Hard Knock Life. And me from Backwoods, Michigan, I was like, yeah, man, I resonate with this. Here we go, East Coast, West Coast. It is a hard knock life. In that, in, that, um, in that song, he really brilliantly put in the hook from the play Annie, the movie Annie. And the, the, the line goes, it's a hard knock life for us. Instead of treated, we get tricked. Instead of kisses, we get kicked, you know? And it's beautiful little Annie, orphan Annie's voice singing that and then Jay-Z coming in over it. Um, but the reality of that song is, I, I think, if you've lived much life, you resonate with the thought, yeah, it has seemed in my life like it's the hard knock life for me. And what that means is not like, I grew up in the hood and I grew up, you know, on, the, on, on, the, on a certain part of town. Like, what that means is like, dude, I've been beat up in life and things haven't gone the way that I thought they would. Or maybe you're in here and you're like, dude, everything in life's been awesome, man. It's been incredible. Uh, I had a great childhood. I had a great, what I would say to you is like, 
just keep on living. Maybe just take notes today for when the time comes where you're like, ooh, ooh, that did not go like I thought that it was going to go. Um, there's, a, there's a t-shirt that I saw that I really love that says, life's tough, wear a helmet, you know? Um, that's typically how we deal with it. Like, hey, suck it up, buttercup. Life's tough. It's tough for everybody. The hardest thing you've been through is the hardest thing you've been through. And uh, other people have gone through hard things also. And I think if we're honest, it leads to the question, like, where's God in all of it? Does God really intend for his people to live the hard knock life? Guys like Joel Osteen would say, hey, if you just love God and if you just give to my ministry, I can guarantee that you won't have to live the hard knock life. And that works until it doesn't work. Until you go through something that you're like, he has beautiful hair, but that's not a message of hope. I imagine that King David was asking the same question. Why am I taking so many knocks in life? If God really loves me, why does my life look like this? Why are things so difficult? You are not alone. And what I love about the Bible is that it doesn't shy away from that question. It doesn't at all shy away from the question. So if you are not a follower of Jesus, or maybe you grew up in church and you're like, dude, life is not all rainbows and butterflies. It's difficult. And, and I, I, I have nothing that's being offered to me to answer those questions. Um, the Bible actually speaks to this. It doesn't hold any punches. It doesn't try to rose-colored lenses anything. David's asking the same question. We've been looking at the life of King David in First and Second Samuel, and we're also looking at some of the Psalms that David wrote during the events that are described uh, in his life that are described in First and Second Samuel. David's life took off like a rocket. He goes from being a shepherd, being the least of all of his dad's sons, all of a sudden he goes out, he kills Goliath, he marries the king's daughter-in-law, God anoints him as king, says, you're going to be king of my people. Everyone in Israel is singing songs about David, like his life takes off like a rocket, and then it plummets real hard. What we've seen over the past couple weeks is that David's life is starting to face some real hard knocks. He is driven into the wilderness because King Saul is jealous of him. And that's after King Saul, his father-in-law, by the way, has tried to kill him multiple times. Some of you have some rough relationships with your father-in-law. I don't want to say I know for sure, but I would guess your father-in-law hasn't tried to throw multiple spears at you. Okay? This is David. Not a great relationship. He's in the wilderness. He's away from his family. He's away from the presence of God. Everything in his life looks like God has shown up, dangled a dream in front of you, and then he just did the bait and switch thing. And some of you think that's what God's like. Like he shows up and, and you think, I can't enjoy blessings too much because at some point God's going to pull the rug out from underneath me. This is what David's life looks like. What we saw last week is, or two weeks ago, is that in the wilderness, like, God's doing something. He's teaching David that he alone is his refuge. He's, he's transforming David, but that doesn't make time in the wilderness easy. We talked about the fact that nobody chooses the wilderness. And so if the last two weeks we're answering the question, why does God lead us into the wilderness? Or why does God allow us to experience times in the wilderness where we take hard knocks? The question this week is, what are we to do in the wilderness? What are we supposed to do in the moments of those life, the moments in life where it is knocking us around and no matter how hard we try, we can't make things better in our own strength. We're gonna let David guide us through this psalm. And so I want to read just the first four verses again. Psalm 69, verses one through four. David, while he's in the wilderness, likely running from Saul, prays this. Save me, God, for the water has risen up to my neck. I've sunk in deep mud, and there's no footing. I've come into deep water, and a flood sweeps over me. I'm weary from my crying. This is the same guy who killed Goliath, ripped bears and lions apart with his hands. He says, I'm weary from my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. David's saying, my, eye, my eyes actually ache because of how much I've been looking for God, and he seems nowhere to be found. Those who hate me without cause are more numerous than the hairs of my head. So again, David is in this moment likely running for his life from King Saul. He's in the wilderness. 
And I want you to recognize as you read this psalm what David doesn't pray. David's not in the wilderness said, saying, God, I, I know that you're working all things together for my good. Thank you for leading me here. This is, ter- this, this is going to lead to my good. God, thank you for this. He doesn't say, God, I know you have a future and a hope for me. You have good plans for me. You mean good towards me, not evil. He doesn't pray that. David doesn't even say, God, I know that you're using this season to form and to shape me. Notice what David does pray. Save me, O God. I'm drowning. I've lost my footing. He's saying like, I'm not going to be able to survive through this moment in my life. He says to God, God, don't hide your face from me. My eyes are weary from looking for you. I can't seem to find you. That's what David prays. And in doing this, we're introduced to prayers of lament. Prayers of lament. Now, you may ask, what is lament? It's a good question. Here's my best definition. This is the best John Murphy definition I can come up with. Lament is a soulful expression of sorrow, grief, or anger directed towards God with earthly honesty and an eye towards hope. I say soulful expression because David's able to access the depths of his soul and what he actually feels. David's not trying to say, he's not doing all the shoulds. He's not saying, God, I know I should feel this, I should feel this, I should feel this. He's able to access the parts of his soul and actually say, this is what I'm experiencing in this moment, God. And that's a soulful thing to do. It's not a faithless thing to do. We'll see that as we continue on. It's actually a soul-filled thing to do. It actually reflects pretty deep self-awareness and emotional intelligence. It's a soulful expression of sorrow, grief, anger, despair, etc. David's not doing the thing where he's like, these emotions are the good ones, and then sadness, anger, despair, those are the bad ones that Christ came to free me from, so I can't express those to God. Lament is often expressing sadness, anger, despair, injustice, and it's directed towards God. And what I mean by that is um, David isn't writing just his thoughts into a void. He's not in the midst of a vacuum, He's not gathered his mighty men around him and being like, this cave sucks, guys. Everything in life is terrible. He's actually directing the soulful expression of his, own, his, his, his entire body towards God. So again, notice like who he's praying to. It's towards God, and he does it with earthy honesty. He's in this moment just naming the reality of what life in a fallen world is like. People betray you. Innocent people get killed. Good people go through terrible things. It's earthy honesty. Um, And he does it with an eye towards hope. We'll see that more in a little bit, but his resolve as he offers this lament is to trust God and his promises. And he's making a plea towards God for help. So David just expresses all of this. He's not holding back. He's unedited before God. It's so difficult for so many of us to do because we've been taught. No, Romans 8, 28 says, God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's true, but Romans 8, 28 only becomes a gift as you allow yourself to actually experience the valley, the shadow of death. That's not a hopeful thought for those who won't allow themselves to actually say, this is the reality of my life, God. Where are you? And that's what David does. The book of Psalms is filled with lament. If you think, like, this is just one psalm. David wrote a whole bunch of psalms. This is like he just had a bad day. Over half of the psalms that David wrote are psalms of lament. And of the total 150 psalms in the book of Psalms, a third of them are lament. There's psalms like this where lament is being offered. And as it relates to this concept of of expressing the reality of what we're actually experiencing in life, our culture tends to fall into two different ditches around lament. And one ditch is, I refuse to feel. And the other ditch is, I am ruled by what I feel. So one ditch is, I don't want to feel anything. 
The other ditch is whatever I feel is my everything. And both are unhelpful. So the first ditch, if the first ditch says, I refuse to feel anything, that leads to, to, that leads to numbing out. It's like, that's the way. It is possible in life. My wife would tell you, you know, not because she's done it, but because I have a tendency to do this. It's like, I, I don't like to feel. I mean, I, 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 again, I grew up thinking the measure of a man was you're just even keel. You're not prone to dips or heights. You're just even keel. Um, the problem with that, the danger with a f- refusing to allow yourself to feel and express these things is it actually works until it doesn't work. It works for a while, and it works good. But if how you learn to deal with life is just to shove that stuff down and down and down, it's like a pot of boiling water with a lid on the top. Eventually, as the water starts to boil, the pot starts to shake. And that pressure is going somewhere. It works until it doesn't work. Pete Scazzaro says this. In our culture, addiction has become the most common way to deal with pain. We watch television incessantly. We keep busy running from one activity to another. We work 70 hours a week, indulge in pornography, overeat, drink, take pills, anything to help us avoid the pain. Some of us demand someone or something take our loneliness away. Sadly, the result of denying and minimizing our wounds over many years is that we become less and less human. Empty Christian shells with painted smiley faces. For some, a dull, a dull, low-level depression descends upon us, making us nearly unresponsive to all reality. There's no greater disaster in the spiritual life than to be immersed in unreality. In fact, the true spiritual life is not an escape from reality, but an absolute commitment to it. Sad things should be named as sad. Anger, though it can turn into rage and sin, anger actually shows you what you care about. If you'll start to peel back the the, the layers of anger, why am I angry like this? What's going on? What is my soul desiring as I express this kind of anger? What you'll typically find if you do that is you'll find there's something that you deeply care about. And that's actually a good thing. You gotta do the work to get there. Here's the thing, like in this first ditch, I'm I'm gonna refuse to to feel certain types of emotions that I don't wanna feel. You can't selectively numb emotions. You can't say, I refuse to feel anger, I refuse to feel sadness, because eventually you'll learn to stuff that so well that you'll get to a point in your life that you realize, oh, I also can't feel joy. These moments where I should be in tears watching my son or my daughter do this, I feel nothing. God, that's no way to live. That's not how God intends us to live. You can't selectively numb emotions. So if that's one ditch, I refuse to feel anything. Feelings are bad. Feelings are for weak people. The other ditch that our culture, because if you watch culture, it's just, it swings from one extreme to another. The other extreme is being ruled by your emotions. That's when you begin to say, it, being ruled by your emotions is, is a refusal to actually process your emotions. To be ruled by them is to refuse to actually pursue healing because whatever your emotion and feeling is becomes your primary identity in life. And so I can't put this down, I can't heal through it because I don't know who I am without this thing. It makes us th- say things like, what I, whatever I feel is my truth and no one can touch it or speak into it which is emotional manipulation. It's emotional manipulation to say, what I feel in this moment is the highest and greatest truth in my life, and if you won't acknowledge that this is true, or to say, I feel this about you, and now I've put on you the weight to make me feel differently about this. It's emotional manipulation. Both ditches are unhelpful, and I think lament is the way to right the ship in both directions. So, a prayer of lament Learning to pray lament is for you if you're prone to say, yeah, I tend to refuse to feel things. A prayer of lament is also for you if you would say, I actually am ruled by whatever I experience in a given day, week, or moment. There is a different way. There's another way. So I want to show you the gift of lament. 
Lament is a gift from God given to his people, and this is what David does in the wilderness. And in fact, in the wilderness is whatever the wilderness I, whatever the plural of wilderness is. This is what David does in all the wilderness of his life. He begins to express sorrow, grief, or anger. He directs it towards God with earthly honesty, and he does it with an eye towards hope. So four thoughts um, about the idea that lament is actually a gift. First, lament honestly acknowledges your experiences and desires. To offer a prayer of lament honestly acknowledges your experiences and desires. See, we, we tend to have this aversion towards honestly naming our experiences and our desires. We for sure have it with God, and we typically have it with the people of God. So you know, you're like, how are you doing, man? Things seem really rough right now. It's, well, it's all going to turn out okay. I'm blessed and highly favored. How are you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. And there's something in us that's like, oh, that's not actually how I feel in this moment. <laughs> but I don't want to offer this because it's not a good thing. Lament actually enables you to honestly acknowledge your experiences and your desires. We tend to think that somehow, if we're honest about what we're actually experiencing in the moment, it means that we don't have faith um, or trust God. So let me, just, let me just offer to you, this is just as inspired as the Gospels. It's just as inspired as Romans 8. It's just as inspired as everything else. So let me, let me show you how David honestly names his experiences. Verse 1 and 2, he says, the water has risen up to my neck. I have sunk in deep mud. I have no footing. Verse 3, David says, I'm weary from my crying. My throat is parched. Verse 8, he says, I'm a stranger to my brothers and a foreigner to my mother. That's a poetic way for him to say, because of what I'm experiencing, I don't even know my family anymore. I haven't seen my family in so long that I'm a foreigner to my mother. Verses 10 and 11, he says, this is powerful. He says, I mourned and fasted, but it brought me insults. I wore sackcloth as my clothing, clothing, and I was a joke to them. That's David saying, hey, it seems like I've done everything right, and everything's going wrong. He says in verse 20, insults have broken my heart. I waited for sympathy and comforters and found none. David's not doing life like sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can never hurt you. David's like, no, no, no. God, their insults have broken my heart. He's naming his experiences. But David also, and Psalms of Lament also represent our desires. We name not just what we're experiencing, but we name, God, this is what I desire in this moment. Look again at verse 1. He says, save me, God. I want to be saved. Verse 6, he says, don't let those who put their hope in you be disgraced because of me. Lord God of armies, don't let those who seek you be humiliated because of me, God of Israel. He's saying, God, I don't want people to be able to look at my life and say, I don't, I don't want anything to do with your God. <laughs> Why would I want anything to do with your God? Look at your life. Your life was way better before you turned to God. David's saying, God, I, I don't want people to think that. He says in verse 13, God, would you give me a time of favor? It's okay to pray that. It's okay to say, God, would you give me a season of favor? He's saying, answer me with your salvation. Again, verse 14, rescue me, God. Verse 16 to 17, answer me, God. Don't hide your face from me. I mean, he's just over and over naming both his experience and his desire. God, I, I, I want you to answer me. I want you to show up for me, God. And then in verses 22 through 28, he cries out for justice in a way that's probably uncomfortable for a lot of us. He says of his enemies, this is David. He says of his enemies, let their table set before them be a snare. His father-in-law, by the way. And let it be a trap for their allies. Let their eyes grow too dim to see and their hips continually quake. Pour out your rage on them and let your burning anger overtake them. May their fortification desolate. Make their fortification desolate. May no one live in their tents, for they persecute the one you struck and talk about the pain of those you wounded. Charge them with crime on top of crime. This is an imprecatory prayer. Charge them with crime on top of crime. Don't let them share in your righteousness. 
David's being able to say, God, what I desire is actually for you to not save them. That's deep. Let them be erased from the book of life and not be recorded with the righteous. David, honestly, in a way that's probably more honest than most of us are, acknowledges his experiences and expresses his desire, but he does it to the right person. That's the second thing I want you to see about the gift of lament. Lament directs its appeal to the right person. David's talking to God throughout this whole appeal. He's not talking to his men. He's not venting to people to try to get them on his side. He's not saying, look at what Saul's done to me. Look at what everything. He's not venting to people. Lament is not venting. He's processing the reality of his soul in the presence of God before the face of God. He's directing his lament to the right person. He's making his appeal to the right person. C.S. Lewis says, we must lay before him, before God, what is in us, not what ought to be in us. John Mark Comer says, prayer isn't a place to be good, it's a place to be honest. And we tend to think in prayer that we've got to be totally theologically astute and God's going to zap us if we say anything that isn't directly in line with his will. David teaches us, no, no, no. God actually invites us to before his face, in his presence, directed towards him, be a bit unedited. What we often do is express sorrow, grief, anger, rage to anyone but God. What we tend to think is, I've got ugly things in my soul and I need to run away from God to either process them by myself or share them with other people so that I can come back to God with the good stuff. And David teaches us, actually, he runs over and over and over to God with the full reality of his soul. We think to offer these type of prayers to God is indicative of a lack of faith David teaches us that lament is actually faith in action. Some of the most faith-filled people that I've ever met and some of the most faith-filled prayers that I've ever met or I've ever read are prayers of lament. Um, Why does lament direct its appeal to God? That's the third thing I want you to see. Um, Because God's the only person who can help and comfort. And so lament is offered to God with an eye towards hope. Lament both looks down, looks in, and looks up. Lament looks down at the reality of what you're facing. It doesn't try to sugarcoat things. It's not like, well, it could be worse. I know somebody else who says it harder. It doesn't do that. It looks down. Lament also looks in. It's honest about this is how I'm experiencing this moment, but lament also looks up. David's honest. He expresses desire, directs it towards God. But notice what he does towards the end of this psalm. Verse 29, he says, As for me, poor and in pain, let your salvation protect me, God. I will praise God's name. By the way, nothing is circumstantially changed for David. I will praise God's name with song and exalt him with thanksgiving. That will please the Lord more than an ox, more than a bull with horns and hooves. He's saying more than any kind of outward action, God will be pleased by me praising him in this moment. The humble will see it and rejoice. You who seek God, take heart. For the Lord listens to the needy and does not despise his own who are prisoners. Verse 34 Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that move in them. David offers the reality of his soul, but he does it with an eye towards his hope. So he's not telling himself in this moment, I should feel differently. Why would I not have trust in God? He's not. He's just, as he offers all of this, he's saying, okay, but God. God saves the needy. He hears the needy. And isn't this beautiful? That in, this is why David, for so many people, feels a bit schizophrenic. He feels a bit like, well, David, which is it? Is it that God doesn't listen to you or that God hears the needy? Is it that your eyes are tired from, for looking for God or is it that he's right there? And David would say, yes. 
he would say yes. And so as I experience moments in my life where it feels like God is absent, like God is not listening, I'm able to express to God the reality of what I'm experiencing and cling on to the promise that God does hear the needy. So though I don't feel it or experience it in this moment, I cling to this weighty truth that God does hear the needy. Fourth and finally, lament is expressed so others might find language and hope in God. Lament is expressed. It's actually offered. It's often written down so that others might find language and hope in God. Notice the heading of this psalm. If you've got a Bible, go back to verse 1. The heading of this psalm says, for the choir director. David wrote his own lament so that the people of God could find language for their lament. I said this a couple weeks ago, I'm so glad that David went through these moments and he wrote because David has given me language where I don't have language. So if you're someone that's like, yeah, I feel all locked up, bottled up, I don't know how to express any of this, open up to a psalm of lament and offer the prayer before God. David will give you language for it. David will give you language for it. And that's what's beautiful. Like expressing lament actually helps others find language and hope in God. Life this side of glory, it, it's a life of hard knocks. And if you learn to offer this, to share it with people as well, it'll help others find language. Um, here's what I know. If I took a poll and every one of you was honest, some of you still don't like this. <laughs> you know, you're like, okay, that was David. I'll give him a pass, but I'm not that guy. I'm not going to do this. Not going to do it. I'm going to stay over here, pushing my feelings down. It's worked pretty well for me. Um, do you know that Jesus offers prayers of lament also? So if it's okay for Jesus, hey, it's okay for you. <laughs> if Jesus can express honestly the reality of what he's experiencing in life before God with an eye towards his hope, you can do it also. This is not something. I know some of you feel like either it's, it's gross and I don't like doing it, it's too much emotions, or you feel like I, this feels like sin. It feels like to accuse God of any of this stuff. It feels like sin. Jesus, both in the garden and on the cross, offers his own prayer of lament. In the garden, as Jesus knows he's facing betrayal by his friends, arrest by the Romans, crucifixion at the hands of the Romans and the Jews, Jesus is sweating blood and he says, God, if there's any other way to do this, could we do that? Then what does he do? I towards his hope. Yet not my will but yours be done. He doesn't only pray, God, your will be done not my own. He says, God, if there's any other way to do this, this is Jesus expressing his humanity. He knows what he's about to face. If there's any other way, God, can we do that? I towards his hope, yet not my will, but your will be done. On the cross, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what does Jesus experience as he offers that prayer of lament? Silence. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is met with silence. David's writing here in Psalm 69 expresses Jesus' experience. Jesus would have taken this prayer to his lips to offer lament. Verse 4 is quoted by Jesus in John 15, 25. But this happened to me so that the statement written in their law might be fulfilled. They hated me for no reason. That comes from Psalm 69. Verse 9 is quoted about Jesus in John 2, 17. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Um... Verse 21 that says, instead they gave me gall for my food and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. All four of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, mention that moment in Jesus' life when he says, I'm thirsty and they, le they lift vinegar up to his mouth. On the cross, 
As Jesus offers lament, he experiences silence. I mean, think of this. The only person in all of history who, because of his faithfulness, his obedience, his righteousness, deserved deliverance and an answer from God, experienced silence from God. And he did it that you and I might never experience, truly experience this, the silence of God. The silence you and I are terrified of was experienced by Jesus at the cross so that you and I might experience the presence of God as we offer lament. God draws towards those who offer lament. In lament, we remember that though I'm experiencing silence from God, though, that, though I feel like God is not with me in this moment, I know because of Christ that that's not true. And what that means is it's actually quite safe to offer God the true reality of what you're experiencing and to do it with an eye towards your hope. This is what I'm experiencing in this moment. But because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ in my place, who bore the punishment for my sins, rose from my justification, because of that, I know God is never truly silent towards me. I know he'll never leave me or forsake me, which means like a good father, you can go to him and say, God, save me, answer me. Help me see what's going on. That's what good dads do. A good dad, if your son or daughter comes to you and says, hey, man, I don't feel loved by you. A good dad in that moment doesn't say, you dumb dumb. Look at the roof over your head. Look at the food on your plate. What do you mean you don't feel loved by me? A good dad in that moment kneels down and gives expression of the reality of the love. That's been there all along. That's what we're offering in Lament. Hey, I want to invite you to stand with me. Those who are coming, uh, who are serving communion can come down front. Um, in a moment, we're going to come to the table of Jesus to receive broken bread and poured out wine to remember Jesus' body broken for us and his blood shed for us. Here's what I want to ask you to do before that, and this is not just this moment. I, I want you to think about this today and this week. Um, I want you to consider this question, what do you need to lament? Do you have anger in your life, sadness in your life, grief in your life, confusion in your life? that if you're honest, you won't let yourself feel or you're terrified of actually expressing to God. What in your life do you need to lament? And if nothing comes to mind, just ask God for help. Hey God, is there a part of my heart that I refuse to let you into? Is there some type of suffering in my life that has become like my precious? I've got to hide this from everybody else. I've got to hide it from God. I've got to cling on to it because I don't know who I am without it. What do you need to lament? And I want to encourage you to do this. Just pray some psalms of lament. You don't have to have the perfect prayer. David wrote them. <laughs> Go to what, there's a handful of them there. 10, 13, 55, 60, 79. There's 45 more of them. Just pray those psalms to God. If you don't know how to do that, just read out loud the psalm. You'll find some of your own language. And then I want to encourage you to consider writing your own prayer of lament. As you begin to learn from David and others, maybe you pick up a pen and you start to write your own prayer. Um, I didn't do this until 2019. Uh, I would pray psalms, prayers of lament. I would read psalms. Um, 2019 was the first time that I actually picked up a pen and just in a soulful way says, this is what I'm experiencing, God. This is what I desire. And I'm going to do it with an eye towards hope. Um, maybe this week for the first time you write your own prayer of lament. And don't worry, we're not going to next week be like, okay, we're all going to read them together. You can lock it away. You don't have to share it with anyone else. Maybe you offer your own. So 
as you come to the table in a moment, I want you to just consider that question with God. Where do you need to offer lament? If you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to ask you not to come to this table, but I do want to invite you in. This isn't a moment where I want you to experience a stiff arm. You can't participate in this moment. This is a meal of faith, and you have to have faith for the meal to mean anything. If you don't have faith, it doesn't mean anything, and it could be harmful for you to take it. But I do want to invite you to Jesus. I want to invite you to consider the question, is God good enough that he can handle how I feel about him? Might it be true that God's such a good father that in this moment, what he doesn't ask me to do is try harder, be better, perform more. What he does in this moment is says, come to my son who's done everything necessary for you to be adopted into my family and in faith confess your rebellion and receive the grace and mercy of Jesus. If you have questions about following Jesus, please come find me, find one of our leaders. We'd love to talk with you. When you're ready, come to the table.